Hi there! I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of the non-fiction that I've read lately, which just by fluke, I think, has taken the form of a number of pieces that are art and arts related. One of my dog-walking friends in the neighborhood is a retired art teacher, and she has a membership at, with the Art Gallery of Ontario, and I've been going with her because with that membership you get free entry both to the museum for yourself and a friend, and also free tickets to each of their special installations, which normally cost more, so we went and saw the Impressionist event, and then we went back again recently and saw there's a First World War scrapbook event, which was interesting. I did take some footage, not of the Impressionist part, because I hadn't realized when we went to that that you were actually allowed to film in the in the galleries. Later on I realized that, so I didn't actually get to film the stuff that is probably more interesting for people, but I might insert some of that either on the end or at the side. So the first one thing that I read was a book in the Coach House series that I talk about sometimes, which is pieces that tend to be essentially long essays starting conversations on various topics. This particular one is written by David Balzer. It is called Curationism. The subtitle on this one is How Curating Took Over the Art World and Everything Else. The second half of this, which I'm going to talk about first, is basically about how everyone is a curator now and that that's what your Pinterest board and your Instagram feed and all of that are. It takes a look at things like what does a stylist do and what does your home decorator do and aren't they essentially curators. And that was very interesting, it was written in a very conversational style. It was good stuff. And that read exactly as this series does. It's a conversation starter. It could be something that you could discuss over coffee with a friend when you have an awkward silence and you could say, hey, I just read this book. However, the second section of this book was actually only, only took up the final quarter of it. The majority of this book was the first section, which is about the history of curation in art galleries and how it started out as essentially something that a librarian did that didn't have a lot of artistry to it itself but gets into the history of essentially the rise of celebrity curators and Hans Oberst and whatnot. The writing style was just over the top in terms of ostentatious, ridiculous, pretentious nonsense. Anything that could be described in a simple sentence would be described in a sentence that includes, I'm not even joking, six clauses within it. It was just so over the top that for about the first 10 pages I thought it was a parody of something, but when it continues to 90 pages you realize this isn't parody, this is how the guy is writing. It was so ridiculous that I was reading it out loud to people and they were telling me to please stop because they couldn't understand any of it and it was ridiculous, or that he was in love with his own voice or something. So. Yeah, it was. it's a really strange stylistic because choice. Because the whole idea of the rise of curation as an art and not just as a science, essentially, is really interesting. But the way that the first section of this was written was just ridiculous. And clearly not the author's only style because part two, which unfortunately was not half the book, wasn't like that at all. So. That was quite bizarre. When I had found that, I was also looking through other offerings that my library had on Overdrive from Coach House Books, and I was looking for more books in that particular series, but what I found instead was, was a book in their Utopia series, which is a series discussing essentially a series of Toronto-specific books. This one in particular is called State of the Arts, Living with Culture in Toronto. And I found this interesting. This is by a variety of authors. I will note the editors down below. Each chapter is that person's opinion on the state of the arts in Toronto. I find this interesting because I think there's a lot of variety in how the arts here is perceived, depending on what people are comparing it to. I think the people who are focused on wanting to compare to something like a New York or a London, which is obviously a much larger city, is very interesting in that how that looks different to someone who's comparing to some of the smaller Canadian cities. And I think a lot of the, the, the snobbier commentary comes from people who kind of look down their noses at the idea of comparing Toronto to, say, Edmonton. But at the same time, I think it's almost equally ridiculous to be comparing Toronto to a city that is, you know, two to three times larger, which is what a lot of the bigger ones are doing. So I think that's the kind of the dilemma of a city of this size, uh, similarly to Chicago, theoretically similarly to Houston, but 
Houston is a different kind of city. There's commentary in here, for example, from people who talk about how Toronto features in American television and, and films standing in for other cities. And the standard jokes of, you know, they messed it up so that it would look like Chicago, but then the city cleaning crew cleaned. And of course that's something that, if you are, are from Toronto, is fun to notice. I mean, sometimes it's ridiculous. They do mention things like, I think it was the Jennifer Lopez movie, Angel Eyes, where it's supposed to be Chicago, but there's genuinely a point where they're driving on the Gardner and you can see the CN Tower in the middle of it. Whereas a lot of films try to do a little bit better. I remember seeing one that was supposed to be DC and it was very well hidden, but then there are one or two moments where it walks past a shop and you're like, no, no, that's that's by Bay and Bloor. So some of those things are fun, but then other bits are people complaining about how artists don't make enough money. There's a lot of yes, but to a lot of that, that the Canada culture grants aren't high enough and where does the blame go in some of this? Because these are only individual essays from different contributors, it's not terribly cohesive, but that's probably not the goal behind it. I mean, it was an interesting read if you are interested in what people think about the arts culture in Toronto. I almost thought it was a shame that one of the editors hadn't written better linking pieces, bringing them all together and pointing out where some of the different perspectives were coming from, because I did think, as I said, a lot of them were, if your comparisons are coming from this direction or your comparisons are coming from this direction, the, the linkages in between there, the look is going to be different, and I think it would have helped to see someone acknowledge that a little bit more explicitly. So, like any collection, it has its pros and it has its cons. Finally, I picked up something that I was just kind of curious about, which you can't see the title on, but this is called My Name is Jason, Mine Too. This is a collection of poetry by Jason Reynolds, who today is writer for of middle grade fiction and of young adult fiction in verse, since this was originally published 10 years ago and he's won a number of awards since then. That's an aside because that's not what this is. What this is, is this is a joint production between Jason Reynolds and his old roommate, Jason Griffin, um, who is a visual artist. They knew each other at university or at art school, I'm actually not sure which. And so it is a combination of the one Jason's poetry with the other Jason's art. And this is apparently something they worked on together when the two of them moved to New York City together. The last time I talked about reading nonfiction, I talked about Alana O'Kun's uh, The Curse of the Boyfriend Sweater, which despite pretending to be stories about crafting is really about her moving to New York City. This I thought was a more entertaining and different look at that because one of my complaints in that book was that there are so many stories about artists and writers moving to New York and what happens then. And I didn't feel like most of that really did anything different with the exception of one or two, whereas this is very different. I don't know that this is 100% successful, but it was interesting to flip through. I thought this was entertaining. But I don't know that this is worth the whatever it is, $17.50 Canadian that this would have cost to buy, but for something to take out of the library, I think it's fun. I think if you're a fan of uh, Jason Reynolds' young adult or middle grade writing, it might be fun to see kind of what he writes. This is more, I guess, writing that he did for himself and for his friend and whatnot, so I think that's maybe interesting. I would say that the art is not necessarily the kind of art that I would be drawn to, but I like the the co-production kind of element that that had to it, so that was fun to look at. All right, have you read anything arts-focused lately? I'd love to hear what you what you were reading and if you enjoyed it, and if it suffered from anything like the incredible pretentiousness of that first book that I picked up because that was ridiculous. Like it would have been so interesting and instead it was so frustrating. Anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.